Father, just thank you that today is your day. Thank you for the time we've already spent together this morning. Lord, I want to pray for us and I want to pray for all the other groups that are meeting out the back as well this morning, Lord, that they and I and us will hear your word spoken into our lives and it changes us. In the name of Jesus, amen. Well, let's say good morning properly while I'm still 43. Good morning. Um, how do you feel like last year? Well, it was only last year, but it felt like yesterday, that's what I mean. Um, anyway, great to see you. This is my new time of speaking with the new configuration. So, oh, it sounds weird under here. Hello. Um, anyway. Pastor David spoke last week on Ecclesiastes, but before he spoke, he decided that at the moment between ourselves, it was good pastor, bad pastor, him being the bad pastor and me being the good pastor. That's what he said. That's how he said it. And um, because he felt that um, his teaching would be, "Mm," because it's Ecclesiastes, and you would feel, oh, thanks for having a go at us, because he talked about death. And this week, that apparently I'm good pastor, but I'm talking on James. I leave you to be the scorers at the end of this sermon, okay? We've been going through the letter of James, and we're halfway through almost now. We're going to be looking at James chapter 3. Now, just to say again, James was the leader of the Jerusalem church. He was also the half-brother of Jesus, The letter is meant for Jewish Christians who are now living in Gentile cities due to the persecution that broke out against the church in Acts chapter 8. And this letter was written somewhere around maybe the late 40 AD, something like that. And the teaching, if you you read the letter and you look at Matthew's chapter 5 to 7, you will see clearly sort of the Sermon on the Mount, as it's known. You will see those two chapters sort of underpinning and or the letter sort of coming from a lot of that teaching, bringing a lot of that teaching into place. So what that really means is that James actually listened to his brother and took on board what he said. Not a lot of families, I bet, can say that about their siblings. But this is the case. So we're going to look at James chapter 3, verses 1 to 12 only. I will be honest, I was hoping I might be able to get in the whole of chapter 3 this morning, but as the week went on and went on, I thought, hmm, not going to do it all. It's going to not do it justice, so we're not going to do that. So we are going to just look at uh, verses 1 to 12. But... What have we learned so far in the first two chapters? Can anybody remember? Let me take you back to chapter one. Billy Ocean. Okay, can we, can we, can we start? Come on. Wendy, go on. No, no, don't sing it, Steve. Something about the tough. <laughs> Cheers, Wend. Right. When the going gets tough, the tough get gone. Either the tough get going, i.e. it's about trials and temptations. It's how we face them. Some profess to be really good Christians, really, oh, probably maybe the most mouthiest of them about doing things for the Lord or, or, or whatever else. And look at what I'm doing, actually. But when trials and temptations come, they're the first to cave in and to collapse. It's about the judgment of that. But it's also about us taking trials and temptations as an opportunity to spiritual maturity, actually helping us grow. Anything else? What about chapter, carrying on in chapter one? Anything else you can remember from the last few times that I've taught? Marla, thank you. Slow to speak, quick to listen. Slow to speak, quick to listen, thank you. Or I've got it down as quick, slow, slow. No, not strictly ballroom dancing. Andy. You need to have um, acts as well as, as deed, uh, deeds, as well as just saying things. You need to look after people and actually sort of put your money where your mouth is. 
Fantastic. Thank you. Yes. Doers, doers of the word, rather than just saying that you are believers in Jesus. Anybody else? Okay. Yeah, I've got that. Quick, slow, slow. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. Being doers of the word, not just listeners. It must change us. Reading this book and your relationship with God should change you. And uh, two weeks ago, we looked at not showing favoritism. Meant to treat everybody squarely and fairly. And yes, being a doer of the word means we're shaped by the Bible and therefore faith without deeds, faith in Jesus without doing anything is dead. So that's the cheery bit. Let's move on to the, I want to say cheery bit again, but yes it is. James chapter 3. Let's read the first two verses. My favourite verse opens up now. Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers. And by the way, sisters is also included in that. Because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he is a perfect man, person, able to keep his whole body in check. As I said, it's my favourite verse. I said it right at the beginning of the teaching of James, my first introduction, that, uh, well, I stand, as Pastor David does, and we'll move on a bit further, broaden that, under stricter judgment than other Christians, because we're teachers. It makes me so warm and fuzzy inside. Does it you, Pastor David? Yes. James is definitely talking to teachers, normally leaders within the church. But note this with James, he says, we. So he's lumping himself in that category. He's not having a go and just saying, you church leaders. He's saying, we shouldn't presume to be teachers. Because if we do, we're judged more strictly. He's lumping himself is. And he's quite rightly saying that us who teach have to unpack God's word. We disciple people, we pastor people. Therefore then, the things that come out of our mouths and the way that we teach, we have to make sure it's of God in some way. We have to make sure that our lives are sorted and we're sort of walking with God and we're doing that because we will be judged more strictly if it's not. We're here to care for you and guide you in your, your walk, yes? So therefore then, we have to make sure that we're doing the right thing. If I start interpreting this Bible incorrectly, like really incorrectly, and say things that are clearly not here, then I, I'm going to talk about me, I've got a problem. I will be judged very strictly by God. point of this is James is going to be talking about the tongue in the moment and explains that words are clearly have strength behind them. Do you remember me? I don't know if you remember, I, I talked about a movie called Inkheart. Uh, it's a book also. And the premise behind the book is that as somebody reads the book, the words that they're reading actually manifest something real. It's a fantasy book. It's not reality. It's a fantasy. He actually pulls characters out of the book and they become real. It's the same with us. Our words that we speak have an impact in people's lives. So as a teacher... Somebody who speaks, hopefully the words that come from my mouth are God's words and they should have an impact in your life. So we've got to make sure that they are God's words. Hence why we're judged more strictly. And we're judged by God. It doesn't say that here. But you will see through the letter, he talks very much about it's about God who makes the judgments. And also, as I said to you, this came from um, the teaching is underpinned by Matthew 5 and 7, by the Sermon on the Mount. And when we look at Matthew chapter 7, verse 2, which I'll quickly do that now. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way as you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And Jesus is making it clear there that it's only 
God that should do the judging. So it's God that will judge us, the ultimate sustainer of the universe. That's a big judge. Why do I go on about it? Because it's something that sits, you know, as an overthing every time that a sermon is prepared or any meeting that we're in. It's God that's going to judge us. And it doesn't just sit with the two pastors. The leadership team. The Sunday club leaders. Oh, you thought you got away with it. Didn't you, Auntie Bas say? No. Kresh. Youth. Anybody that's a leadership within a church context, and actually any leadership, government leadership, whatever, are actually judged by God. But I'm just talking here at the moment about church context as James is doing so. Because the words that come out, especially saying Sunday club, Auntie Bosse, but he'd be listening now. Even in Sunday club, the words that come has an impact on that generation. So we presume to be teachers must recognise we are judged more strictly. So anybody that thinks a leadership role is a nice, cushy, luxurious job, dispel that myth. Wouldn't have it any other way, personally. Because when you're built this way and gifted to do these things, you get on with it. Because you're doing what God wants you to do. But you recognise that you are judged. So, why I'm emphasising that? Well... The leadership team nominations are open at the moment. So you have to think prayerfully and carefully. Never assume it's a nice, cushy role and it's just something easy to get into. And it's easy to do. Because it's not true. You have to be guarded. And your relationship with God as a leader has to be correct as it can be, allowing for grace. Because we are judged more strictly. I wake up every morning thinking, gosh, I'm judged more strictly. No, I don't. I wake up thanking our Father for the day, but I do recognise that I am judged more strictly, especially when I come to prepare sermons. Just thought I'd say that. What I like about James is here, and we're going to come into this a bit more, is the fact he says we all stumble. So there is that grace. It's recognised that all leaders do stumble. And it's okay. Should be allowed for slightly. But it doesn't make an excuse for us to just do as we please whenever we like to. Even Sunday club leaders. Sorry, Auntie Bus, I'm just going to keep picking on you way there. But even Sunday club leaders. It is not just something you throw together. It's something you have to pray for. And yeah. So. But James moves on. He doesn't just talk about leaders now. The rest of the passage is all of us. So you ready for the rest of the passage? Feeling cheerful? There is some positive stuff now. It's working towards it, don't worry. It's talking about the tongue. That eedy little biddle thing in your mouth. That eedy little biddle thing that gives you all those wonderful taste buds when you consume food. Yes? Who had breakfast this morning? Did you enjoy your breakfast this morning? Was the taste of it good this morning? I had apple granola in honey. It was lovely. This little itty bitty thing actually told the rest of my body, you're consuming really nice food right now and you're enjoying it, aren't you? James says, let's talk about the tongue. Now, as we mention tongue as we go on through this teaching, I'll make this very, very clear. The tongue is not a standalone from the rest of the body. It is attached to the rest of you. I don't know if you've noticed that before. Okay, that's good. But also, when you talk about the tongue, we're talking about email. In today's context, Twitter, Facebook, letters apparently, those old-fashioned things. What's up? Whatever that is. (laughs) What's up? I don't know. Whatever it is. Telephone. Face to face. No, no, face to face. No, I mean face to face. I don't know what. What's what's FaceTime when it's at home? Oh, Skype. Skype, I understand. Thank you, Andy. I understand Skype. Uvu. That's the other Skype version. And also not face to face. What's not face to face? 
behind the back gossiping. Thank you, Andy. So when we are talking about the tongue today, count all of that into the mix. It's very, very important that you do. I think I missed texting, didn't I? Texting equally. Actually, one of my biggest bugbears is texting, I will admit with you, because you never get the full what's going on behind the scenes. You don't hear it or see it. You just see what's in front of you. You don't understand the tone that's gone on. You don't understand the facial features. You just read a text. And if you misread it, if you think you're reading it through, I understand this person, and it's all in capitals, you might think they're shouting at you. They may not be. They just don't know how to do the upper and lower case. <laughs> and we so misread it, all based upon our own, oh, don't like this person, oh, they're having a go at me, oh, and it's actually your, your vision, your problem, not them. See each other face to face. Then you can get the whole picture. And then if you find you're shout, being shouted at, fine. Don't shout back. And I look in the mirror and say that to myself. So just I want to lump that all in there because it's very, very clear. We see lots of things in regards to the media and how people wished they hadn't sent something. I think it was... Um, who was it? Um, it was Andy Murray who, when the Scottish referendum was going, that morning he tweeted something and it caused such a furore. Uh, just unbelievable. Now, you all know I love Wimbledon, so I like Andy Murray, support him all the way. And what his comments were, that's down to him. And what his opinions are, are down to him. He said himself afterwards, I stood by what I said, or what I meant, I just wish probably in hindsight I hadn't set it, sent it. So, you know, I'm just using that as one example of be very careful. So, tongue, that's all of that. You got that? Cool. And if you can think of other technological ways of communicating, put that in as well. So, let's look at the positive side to the tongue, shall we? We all stumble in many ways, verse 2. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he is a perfect man able to keep his whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. I'm going to stop there at 5a. James has already emphasised that we all stumble. So if you're going to think this is a, I must keep my tongue always in check, yes. But I fail at doing this, yes. That's okay. James is being realistic. He recognises that we all stumble. We all sometimes do and say things we'd rather wished we hadn't. Now everybody's going to say, can I keep my head straight without nodding and agreeing? Can I try not give away that I'm in that? We are, we are all in that camp. James is realistic. But he says, put a bit in a horse's mouth. And you know that the horse will obey you. Anybody horse rider? Anybody sort of ever controlled a horse? Thank you, Carrie. Yeah. Put it in the horse and you can steer the horse pretty much. Yeah. 90% of the time. Yeah. It is an animal at the end of the day. And you can control it. This is a positive. James says, or take a ship, which for me is a better example, one I can understand. Take a ship, big ship, battered around in the storm, being tossed and turned about the ways. Imagine a big ship, and it's got a itty little bitty rudder. That little bit of of rudder can control the whole ship in a big storm. Who's ever been on a ship in stormy weather? Yeah? Get tossed about a lot, didn't you? In a tsunami, well, there you go. You get tossed around a lot. The waves kick up. You may not feel too well after a while. Depends how strong your stomach is. I'm okay. 
No, I'm not going to tell that story. No, so... <laughs> yeah, who had their breakfast? No, moving on. Um, but the ship, the pi- still ultimately, the captain and the pilot and all that could navigate where the ship needed to go because of the rudder. Not the engines. The engines just make it go forward. It's the rudder that actually steers it. Now, when James wrote this, you might well think, well, he doesn't understand big ships of today. Well, they did. Their ships were quite large in their time. I'm going to tell you about one that got built in AD 40. Just for the sake, just so you've got an idea that he does know what he's talking about. It was a very large barge that carried from Egypt to Rome what is known now as the Vatican Obelix, which is the tall needle-type structure that sits right in the middle of St. Peter's Square. Seen pictures of it? It's a big thing. It's about 25 and a half metres tall, apparently. The boat, or the barge, that uh, took it from Egypt to Rome was about 95 to 104 metres in length. And for those that speak my language, 341 foot. I don't do metric. I don't understand it. That's big. That's long. This beam was about 66 foot high. Or wide, yeah. It had six decks to it. It's a big ship. And this was in AD 40, prior to this letter being written. And it displaced apparently a minimum of 7,400 tons and could carry the crew of about seven to 800. Big ship. So he understood what he was talking about when he said, take a mighty big ship tossed around by the waves, itty bitty little rudder controls it. So, take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder. Your tongue, unless you've been blessed, is quite small compared to the rest of the organs in your body, yes? And that little tongue, according to James, is like a rudder of a ship. And this is what I like. For me, if you're in a storm, or to use another term, a trial of some kind, you can normally navigate your way through that trial and that storm by the controlling of your tongue. Just like a ship can, in a storm, be controlled by the rudder. What do I mean? It's a positive thing. You could be in your workplace, friendship group, whatever, and there could be some grief coming your way, some trouble coming your way. You're aware of it in advance. Sometimes we're so quick to want to go and defend ourselves in advance and so start talking about it or talking to other work colleagues about it. Look, I used to work in the business. I used to remember so often you end up having conversations with people about how much trouble they're about to be in, but they talk to you about it. So hopefully they go to enough people so they might get enough defense behind them. So when they are in trouble, they say, well, so-and-so's on my side, even though all you've done is listen to them. Doesn't mean you've actually backed them up. You just heard them. And you can see that happening in the workplace. And sometimes we can open our mouths prior to, and we get ourselves into more trouble because we've opened our mouths. The tongue can control our course. If we keep our mouths shut sometimes and let God do the work, we might find we won't be in so much trouble. I'll give an example of that. This morning, during the worship time practice between eight and nine, no, nine and ten, sorry, Uh, They were practicing here, you see, and um, uh, me and Steve were just over here on the laptop. Steve asked me a question, so I go to answer the question. So Hannah's leading, uh, the singers and the musicians up there in in some practice, and they stopped at that moment, and Hannah was carrying on teaching and and talking and, and chatting through what she wanted for this morning, yes? Well, I opened my mouth, Now, apparently I've got a big mouth. Amen. Bless you. Thank you, Pastor David. 
So at that point, I'm talking quite rightly to Steve. We're actually talking about something serious. Don't say it makes a change. But we were talking about something serious. And, but my mouth was apparently not. So at that point, my wife decided to go, shh. Who was playing the piano, by the way? And uh, be quiet. Hannah's teaching us something. So I looked up and I thought, don't tell me off. I can't help it. This was what was going through my head. I now am going to say something to defend myself. I'm now going to make sure that I get... And then I realised there's all these people up on the stage and I thought, do you know something? You're about to teach about controlling your tongue. <laughs> Practice what you're about to preach. So I said nothing. Do you know, until the moment I've just spoken now, nothing else has been said. But I reckon if I'd open my mouth to try and defend myself, be a bit sarky back, try and, you know, you know try and joke my way through it, it would have gone on for another few minutes, would have disrupted more things going on, and I bet Joy and I will be having a conversation later on back at home. <laughs> Before she places in front of me a large humble pie and says, eat it. <laughs> the point I'm saying is, it was a good example this morning, and I thought, yes, hmm. It's a positive thing to actually sometimes have control of your tongue in trials and situations, to actually keep your mouth stum. You can navigate yourself through storms if your tongue is in control. Also, you can navigate yourself through storms when God is telling you to say the right things at the right time. It's very important. So... Next time you see something like a ship or you're on a ship with the storm, think about the rudder that's controlling that ship and it gets you safely to harbour because the pilot is controlling it. Think about if you're in a trial or a problem right now, ask God to control your tongue to help guide you through it. The tongue is the small part of the body and it is dependent on how it's used, determines in which direction it goes. If a pilot of a ship decides to steer into rocks, that's where it will go. Or if he lets go of the tiller and lets it take its own course and just let it run off on its own way of running it will eventually crash at some point because it will go with the waves and they always head for sure eventually so it's a positive thing about your tongue let God control it allow him to navigate you through your trials if you're going through troubles now actually ask God to let you open or shut your mouth at the right time to send that email or not to send that email? How many people have sometimes written an email in anger? Oh, look, there was a bit of uh, shuddering there from various people. <clears throat> you've written out the email and then you've just sent it. And after he's gone, <gasps> <laughs> some of us have learnt the trick write the email, stick it in drafts, sit on it overnight, come back to it the next day, and then delete it. Or go back and re-amend it, soften it up a bit, and then send it. Because you've done it in prayer rather than in temper. So, let's carry on. What else has James got to say to us? You're going to think so differently about your tongues later on when you're eating. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man. But no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. 
Soak up those words. Soak up those descriptions of your tongue. James is building a progressive description of the tongue. How's your tongue feel now, okay? Mine's getting dry as I speak, but it's fine. First and foremost, he describes it as something that can create a great fire. Or I prefer the phrase wildfire, as we call them now. Has anybody ever seen a wildfire actually at work? Thank you, Miriam. Sometimes you see it on the news. You see it uh, in Australia. Uh, is one of the key areas you see it these days. And certain parts of America seem to be the ones that are most widely reported. I'm sure they happen elsewhere as well. And they just seem to go... <laughs> and cause distraction wherever they go. This was the description I found of a wildfire. A wildfire differs from other fires by its extensive size. The speed at which it can spread out from its original source, its potential to change direction unexpectedly, and its ability to jump gaps such as roads, rivers, and fire breaks. A fire, a bonfire at home, you can control. A wildfire seems to be from the minute its source sparks it, can see very rapidly just to just go and just to suddenly just go completely up um, and just start devastating vast swathes of land and trees and forests. And it jumps. It's almost like, I think you see it in some movies, they try and make it seem like it's alive almost, the way it just seems to jump and, and destroy houses and homes and people's lives and kill. And it can leap over roads. It, it, it doesn't need, you know, you can have a big road, but it's enough that the flames will go and it then will spark enough and catch another uh, set of trees on the other side or dry land and it will just keep going. Even when breaks are put in by men or women, you know, fire people who, who try and create a, a false break to try and stop it, it can leap them as well. And for me, this is the imagery that James is using in regards to the tongue when it sparks a small, has a small spark, but then creates a great forest fire. It creates wild fire. And this is, this is the negative side now of the tongue, is that actually, unfortunately, just a small moment, a small word, a little, hey, do you know about that, um, do you know about him down the road? Or what about her sitting next to me in church? Or him in church. Let's not be, um, let's not be biased here. Um, you know, that little word, just that little conversation that you think is really innocent at that moment can cause such a wildfire when it starts spreading. When that person you've said goes and tells somebody else three rows down to the back. And then that person there goes and tells... I'm not pointing at anybody specifically, all right? So don't, don't panic. But that person goes and tells that person over there. It's let. But then eventually, between the two... Oh... Everybody's alight with that one little spark of gossip, that one little indiendo, that little comment that was made. And it happens at work. It's not just in church. Not to face it, it's not just in church, i.e. it happens in church. Shouldn't, but it does. But in the workplace, at schools, in the playground, and I'm not talking about the children. It happens everywhere. That little bit of... And then it spreads. It's a wildfire, is what the tongue does. And wildfires, apparently, are normally born out of dry and arid conditions. And then it only requires a small moment. Now, four major natural causes of wildfires are lightning... Volcanic eruptions, sparks from rock falls, and spontaneous combustion. Those are the natural ones. Guess which one and only comes under the unnatural cause of a wildfire? Put your hands up. All of us, humans, 
We create the unnatural ones, and apparently they're worse than the natural ones. They happen more frequently, and they're due basically out of carelessness. People not putting out or not taking due care in attention in what they're doing in creating fires, or they're doing it deliberately. And I want to note this, that it's dry and arid conditions that cause wildfires. It's when the whole area has not been saturated in water, it's dry, it's bone dry. There has been no watering going on. They cause mass destruction. The Bible likens the Holy Spirit to like water. You see descriptions of the Spirit, uh, John 7, um, where Jesus is talking to the Samaritan woman and says, you know, I've come to give water that's eternal. You, talking about the Holy Spirit. I've come to give something that will well up in a spring in you. It will never thirst. Somebody who cannot keep control of their tongue, who can create wildfires of gossip and everything else, I would suggest comes out of a dry and arid relationship with God. They're not being watered by the Holy Spirit on a daily basis. I'm not talking big flashes of smacks of moments of the Holy Spirit impacting your body and knocking you to the floor. I'm talking about just a relationship of time spent with God. Taking time out, making sure that you are not living a life without relying upon our Father and the gift that he has for us. If we've got a well-watered life with God... I think we won't create so many small sparks as humans, and most certainly as Christians, we wouldn't. James makes it very clear in verse 6 that the tongue also is a fire, and it's a world of evil among the parts of the body. That little itty-bitty tongue is a world of evil. Next time you're checking your tongue for discoloration, you'll think about it differently. And what he's saying, it corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire. And it itself is set on fire by hell. James is using a very unique biblical term when he says about the, uh, sets its whole course, uh, sets, sorry, corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire. He's using a Greek term that literally means will of existence, I-W-H-E-E-L, will will of existence he's saying actually your tongue controls your whole existence if you can control it you're going to be steering a good course in the storm but here you can't control your tongue it's going to set you on fire And the word fire is based around Gehenna. It is exactly what Jesus spoke about, what we now sort of say is hell, the flames of hell. But what he's trying to get at here is the whole fact that your whole life will be set on fire if you can't control this. Feeling warm and fuzzy now? Hmm. Verses 7 to 8 says, All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man. But no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. This is for me a little bit at a moment that you can take a little bit of comfort. Who has pets? Anybody had a pet? Got pets now? Yeah? Dogs? We had the horses thing. We tame animals. There's people that are lion tamers. I don't think they truly tame the animal, but I think they train the animal to obey. James is saying, we humans can do that. 
We can control and tame the animal kingdom. Cats are another ball game, all right? Cats are untainable. They do whatever they want whenever they want it, okay? Let's just make that very clear. They're completely out of the picture on this one. Yes, I am talking from personal experience. Nearly 44 years worth. Right, anyway. But we can control animals. We can even control killer whales. They can, can perform in the water. Many, many, many years ago, I had to go to, I went to a wedding uh, in Florida in um, SeaWorld. The wedding was in SeaWorld. And we then went to watch Shmoo, is it? The Shamu, whatever. The killer whale. Wow, it was amazing to watch to see what they could do with this big killer whale. To tame it, to get it to feed, to get it to do flips and whatever else. Whether you agree with capturing a wild animal and doing that, that's, that's your, I'm just explaining what we humans are capable of doing. Isn't that fantastic? But according to James, we can't control this. We can't control the tongue. We say animals are wild animals, yet we contain them. We don't look at our own tongue and go, it's a wild animal and we need to tame it, do we? That's just my tongue. And this is where you can take the comfort. No man can control it. James is being real. No man or woman can control their tongue. Praise the Lord. Thank you, James. It's not my fault. Nothing I can do about it. Yeah? That's what he says there. But I come back to the fact, if you're in a relationship with our Heavenly Father, through his Son Jesus, and you have the Holy Spirit, and he is living in you, it's him that you rely upon to control your tongue. It's in your relationship with him that your tongue can be controlled. That's why James, right at the beginning, talked about being quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. He started out at the beginning of his letter, within chapter one as we know it now. And it's an ongoing thing. As I said to you, in this letter, it's about the tongue. He builds up this thing about the tongue. Clearly, there was gossip and whatever else going on in the church. There was bad mouthing of uh, rich people. There was bad mouthing of people behind the scenes. There was bad mouthing probably going on in the marketplace. And it was coming from the Christians, the good Christians, the people who know Jesus' grace. Last few verses. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father. And with it, we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. This morning, we had worship time, did we not, as we call it? I mean, our whole life is meant to be worship to God, but I sung worship, did we not? Well, some of you sung and I didn't, because like, I don't want to hurt your ears. But, sung worship. And we all praised God, didn't we? Hallelujah! And we're all like, yes, you're our Father in heaven, and Strength will, ri- will rise as we wait upon the Lord. And yes? Morning. Yes? Oh, good. Okay, we did. Good. Excellent. Fantastic, says James. That's great. But do you know what you also do with that same tongue? You curse. You slag off. You insult. You backstab. You moan about. You criticize. You bring down. You defame. You tear apart. You tear down. You bitch about your fellow human being. Sorry, didn't you like some of those terms? Well, that's what you do. That's what we do. Every single one of us in this room has done it at some point in our lives. (laughs) 
every single, and there are people in this room who are doing it today. Maybe you've already done it when you woke up this morning. Maybe do it this afternoon. And I could be one of those, because we all stumble. James is saying, you praise with this tongue your Father in heaven, and then you totally and utterly have a go at somebody or bring somebody else down with the same tongue, and they're made in God's image. This cannot be, says James. If you're saying, I praise my Father in heaven, but actually my work colleague, my family member, a friend in brackets, a brother or sister in Christ, if I slate them, I'm actually slating God. Because they are made in the image of God. We all like that in Genesis chapter 1. That we're all made in the image of God, do we not? So we can praise our Father in heaven. But we're very good at having a go about fellow human beings. Who are also made in the image of God. James is saying, this cannot be how is this possible? He's actually for making, uh, again, I want to come back to this Greek term to try and emphasize the fact that actually he's trying to describe, the verb he's using is to try and describe and emphasize the bluntness of the fact that this cannot be. You cannot do one thing. You can't do two things that are complete opposites with the same tongue. You should not be doing this. This is wrong. And if I could emphasize it even more strongly, I would do. But I don't want to get too accused of going too far with my language. But you get the point. James is making it very, very clear. Or as Adamson said, one of the commentators I read, strongest pos James used the strongest possible Greek, spoken with all the force of a protesting condemnation. Do not use your tongue to slate someone else and then come to church on a Sunday morning praising your Father in heaven. There is something very wrong. And this is wrong, as James is saying. And James is writing to churches. He is writing to those who are dispersed Christians. Now, ultimately, he's trying to encourage them to walk the better life. But he's saying this sort of thing needs to be challenged. It can't be allowed to go on. So I'm going to quote from a commentary. Now, next few times, I'm going to quote quite extensively from one of the commentaries I read, Stulak. And I'm doing that because, A, it was written really well, and I don't think I can do any better to convey. Two, I can't be accused of, you were talking about me. That happens, Okay. So I'm only right reading what's written here, okay? Do we today, says Stulak, have the same intense reaction, this sense that praising God and cursing people is utterly unthinkable, abhorrent nonsense? Consider the habitual verbal abuse that occurs in our churches. How commonplace is it for us to speak to others with ridicule, or with cutting remarks. How quickly we accuse others of evil motives when they do things we don't like, and how easily we can have angry fights in our churches. And this is the question he has. Where is our biblical sense of shock at all of this? When James talks about fruit, salt water, and spring water, James is stating that in nature, we notice that the f a plant does not produce fruit that it's not designed originally to produce. 
Equally, a water spring cannot produce both fresh and salt water. We see what God is talking to us about in nature. And James is saying, therefore, a true Christian will not make it a regular practice of unchristian speech. And a person who is mouthing off all over and over again is evidence of not being a Christian. Let me unpack that just a bit more. We recognize as Christians, we all slip up from time to time, don't we? But someone who is constantly doing it, who is constantly banging on about maybe the same thing, constantly mouthing off left, right and centre, or is always having little gossips behind the scene, if they're unable to control their tongue, unless they think they might get their own way, someone who clearly never learns, their mouth keeps flapping, or they keep moaning, or whatever else, is evidence, according to James and according to the commentators, of an unspiritual life. James is saying, whenever you hear, in the background behind this, you ever hear stuff going on behind the scenes, somebody having a little bit of a gossip, do we have a biblical intolerance to it? Do we actually say, this is wrong, this needs to be stamped on? James is making it very clear that this should not be. And you should not be scared to challenge the person whose mouth won't stop doing this. That person cannot come into a church and he says, can't praise God in one level and then be slating on another level. That needs to be stamped on. No, I'm not saying that happens in this church. At the moment. but the equally will work in your workplace, in my humble view. James is saying that each one of us must purify our speaking or show yourself to be an imposter and therefore under judgment. And I'm going to finish on this. And these are things to reflect on. And this is, again, from Stulak, who wrote this whole paragraph. And I felt it could not do any better than what was written. To the person who speaks praise to God in the worship service and then abuses people verbally at home or at work, James commands, purify your speech through the week. With the person who says, oh, I know I talk too much and laughs it off, James is not amused. He insists, be quick to listen, slow to speak. By the person who boasts, I always speak my mind, no matter who gets hurt, James is not impressed. He commands, discipline your speaking. Of the person who says, I know I gossip too much, but I just can't help it. James still requires, control your tongue. Of the person who is in the habit of speaking with insult, ridicule or sarcasm, James demands, change your speech habits. He expects disciplines Discipline to be happening in the life of a Christian. Any Christian can ask for the grace needed, for God, give, for God gives good gifts and gives them generously. And we saw that in chapter one. There is then no justification for corrupt habits of speech in our churches today. We simply must repent. We are called to be light in the world. If we are of corrupt speech, we're not being light, are we? I want us to take a moment now to sit before God and do as that last passage does. We simply must repent. Remembering the grace of God you can't control your tongue, but he can help you. 
Let us pray. So, if it's a work colleague that has been brought to your mind, a church member, leader, manager, family member, be they brother, sister, son, daughter, and you know that you've been less than graceful about them, less than nice about them. Repent now, knowing the love of the Father, and ask him to help you to change your speech. If you know of someone who is a destroyer of people by their tongue, and you've never challenged it, Ask God to help you to challenge because the biblical view of it is that we should stamp on it. This cannot be. If you've never challenged, ask God to help you to do so. To get that biblical incense against it. Ask God to help you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.